and time mapping, and interdisciplinary resistance towards narrative practice. Brunch time in Beijing. Koi is eating alone again. In preparing the newspaper column 100 Letters to Children, the young journalist disclosed concern over the new priority set forth by the new regime. According to the angrily scribbled napkin document, Wolf Paper has no right to raise children in between genders in the current war. It was impossible from an editorial perspective, Coy continued, for the mind to reject post-war trauma. Furthermore, there was no evidence that the third eye actually suppressed the functionality of sexual organs. Had she received the letters from the poet, she would have understood that war in her lifetime was an inevitable outcome of third eye's appetite. In the past, Kite's presence had helped Nora to eradicate illogical streaks in Venturi rooms. Something was different about her this time when Nara scratched at her world for help. The walls to her interior responded with an unusual indifference. The ambush drew closer and Nara felt his head drop to the carpet. And as his limbs went numb, Nara was losing control of his psychosis. Gradually he was remembering the past. His mind flashed back to the darkness in lecture halls twenty years ago where angels looked down at him. Death suddenly made sense, and Nara opened his mouth to translate for the last time. Impoverished parents from Glass City prepared blackstone porridge before they departed on suicide charters. Small satchels of spiritual subscription were gathered religiously from the foothills of Ayagami Mountain, where the Pine Sage lived in exile, and the curse of video totem occupied Ayagami's ink painting-like serenity. The darkness of video totem turned all living beings into death drives formless lens. It was the legend of the Pine Sage that altered the fate of children soldiers in Glass City, where morning porridge slipped curses into feeble bodies. Now Nara can see the consequence of his own betrayal through multiple windows. This world kite called home, Nara realized now, was hunting him all along. He watched Kite's old comrades toil new wolf paper in and out of his numb limbs. He watched glass cities evolved distances. The children of middle person became soldiers. The fighting did not stop for a long time. Neighborhoods were destroyed and cities removed from the map. Families were lifeless. The poet grew up in a bungalow with a garden the size of a motel inn things could not be worse at home. Dinner meals comprised of oven-burnt report cards. The evening stroll in the corner of his room was conducted alone, and the poet formulated a lens to destroy feeble bellies. Kite's unusual indifference defeated Nara, and in a finale of broken spells, she was discharged by third eye. Now, as she floated in her normal self, gliding above the city, she saw Nara in the distant landscape, and this sight of closure resembled the warm and dry air inside a collector's cabinet, where she would rest most of her time. As for Nara, Kite has condemned him to the figure of an end-of-the-century residential high-rise building. The frisky playboy turned out to be glass, cement, and construction material. Alone in an indiscernible body, Nara longed for Kite's surveillance. It was unclear who initiated Beijing meetings. Soon enough, Nara and Kite conducted expeditions during the day, anti-mapping and missing each other profoundly. Finally, they became companions before they even met face to face. Two inseparable strangers living in a period of sci-fi endurance. A new class of neoliberal child soldiers was sent out to photograph wars. Nara and Kite were connected by the third eye as part of their basic training. For the uninitiated, at first glance, resistance felt like water gushing away from the body each time the children engaged in another cosmo. Kite felt her body cry war when Nara entered her world. For the longest time, anti-mapping failed her. Yet the impact of Kite's inner resistance relinquished Nara's own self-awareness during attacks.